I'm sitting here in the unceded territory of the Lekwungen speaking people, specifically Esquimalt and Songhees people. And it's an inner harbor of Victoria. This particular stretch is called Selkirk Water, which connects with my home province, Winnipeg. Selkirk is a big name there, historically. And uh, it's, it's a busy harbor, people canoeing, kayaking, and it's a working harbor. I see tugs bringing in barges, loading up those um, crushed cars and so on. I love both aspects of it. Water and birds have been a huge part of my imagination my whole life, right from the beginning. I grew up in a town called Steinbach, which is German for Stony Brook, Stony Creek. We had that. We had uh, dugouts and sand pits in the outskirts of town about five miles away. Went to the Seine River to swim. And uh, once I moved to Winnipeg, it was the two great historic rivers, Red and Assiniboine, meeting at what's now called the Forks, which was an old meeting grounds for First Nations people, burial ground too, I believe. And with occasional forays up to Lake Winnipeg, which is as close as I got to the ocean. And it did have tides. So it's a big lake. And uh, I'm going to begin, though, with a poem about water and a sink. That moment in the morning between sleeping and waking. And for me, it's always cold water in the face. As it's a kind of transition from one state to another state. And it's called Im Spiegel which is taken from a magnificent, the title of a magnificent piece of work by Arvo Perth called Spiegel im Spiegel, Mirror in the Mirror. Mine's just called In the Mirror. Im Spiegel. Naked from sleep, you bend toward the sink. Cup your hands with cold water and splash your face. You raise your head and wake into the morning. But in the mirror is someone behind your eyes, beard dripping, and eyes bluer than you've ever seen. You stand there in the flesh that is not you. You have not seen yourself since the last birth. And you don't wonder after the first shock. You only ask, where have you been so long? One face you touch and you reach for the other. You're standing in a room in the world and the door behind you opens. Every summer, when I was a kid, into my teenage years, we'd hear of one or two people drowning in a sand pit outside of town or in the river. And it was kind of mythical to me. It made me really curious about drowning. And my mother told the story of witnessing, when she was a teenager, her best friend drowned, trying to save another drowning girl. And so my mother always wanted to accompany me whenever I went swimming, which led to me becoming quite deceptive and lying to get away from that. Uh, but one of the terms that came in the newspaper with the drowning was they were dragging the river. And I was intrigued by that. At that time, we're talking the 1950s, dragging the river apparently meant a team of horses connected to a harrow-like contraption trying to find the body at the bottom and drag it up. So dragging the river. Combing the bottom of the dark river for a disappearance, a wrinkle on water, and then an absence. The raking of water of the unseen, and hauling up the detritus of town, wheels, ropes, and rust, dragging the river for the child, lost abruptly in the river's door and in the heat of a July afternoon. Could there be such vast want to be water, to rock in that light where it bends and turns gold? Whose hand in the water, whose handkerchief and slow grief whose flip-flops covered with sand. Did anyone see footprints filled with child? Did someone reach and touch a warm shoulder turning? Horses plod along the river bank, raising dust and sweat. They haul the invisible load and voices call, calling for the bride in her black dress beneath the poplars or walking away from the willows raking through water, fish and reeds, raking for a body, rolling it over and over until it's hooked. Tines tearing through clothes and grasping time, rolling forward into the past and rolling on. Moon reaches into water and tempts us, but does not reach deep enough. Voices 
growing away. I had a boy, she says. I had a son. And for a moment, that is all. For a moment, she lives with that. I moved to the West Coast, oh, 25, 26 years ago. Left the rivers and creeks behind, uh, but found the ocean. And over the last six or seven years, even I have lived right on the ocean, on this harbor, this working harbor. And I love uh, sitting in my room, watching high tides, low tides, activities, barges, tugs going by, and especially the birds. I love watching the birds, crows, herons, gulls. Um, no, they're like messages from the past. They are prehistoric, just as the water is a source. We all come from water. We are water. So this scene here of, of these prehistoric creatures and their calls from the past and the water that we all came from, it, it's just a huge part of my imagination. Pterodactyl. Pterodactyl glides across the water with leathery wings, long legs lowering as it nears the shore. And I'm waking, confused, coming awake to being human. The species, how does it work, this sapiens, this brain? These hands trembling slightly with old age. The body, what is meant by this blessed body? Confused by the species, where are the borderlines? between salmon and sapiens, hawk and human, the heron, standing still in the shallows, priested, yes, then snaky as it uncoils, then stalking on stick legs into prehistory, looking for momentary flashes of light just beneath the surface, stabbing swiftly into the shimmer of a fish, a brief life, and it begins to come back to me, the necessary earth, comes back, my tongue-tied non-existence, the heron rising, legs dangling for a moment, a gaunt ghost of extinction, a million years of it, and me, word-spawned bait. Uh, Valentine's Day, I was going to write a poem for it, and I thought about what it's come to mean, while well, right now it tends to be commercial, right? Um, and what was it at one time? And it just sort of led to this poem, Me and the Crows, Valentine's Day Itch. Guttural cawing from the crow littered roof, them dropping clamshells and me tossing chunks of baguette. They glide down and half a dozen become two dozen in seconds. Waddling around me, is that love? Their bright eyes on this host, as they've been on all the ghosts of us walking pale along streets we've built, language and coins and desire. All that detritus of the made world and that itch, that Valentine's Day itch to keep the species going. Though by now we've replaced it with chocolates and roses and we blame it on Mallory and the Knights of the Round Table, that ancient romance. Always some holy grail in the rear view mirror and them clamshells clattering on the roof. World of the gulls here, as you see. Smooth-hulled gull, a smooth gull, a smooth-hulled gull, rowing through the air with graceful oars, crying like nostalgia, circling higher and higher, and the cry becoming necessary in its distance, a cry of memory, an orientation of prayer, though it becomes slippery and promises hope like the rainbow, evanescent arches of flight building the most ancient highways where spirits have crossed into unmapped lands. And then, in a moment, it dismantles all the scaffolding of heaven, swooping low and splashing to a halt, almost a fish. Imagine that. Lightning sizzled, slanting down like the hidden sun's sperm, like refracted light. But there, I've gone too far. The language won't do. As if there are gods and goddesses on the move, in the air, among the trees. And me, a secular man, longing for Mesolithic mind, something undivided, like a stone eye. 
a man 30,000 years old, standing inside a fall of rain. And though that was yesterday, it's as far as I can go, dreaming back on my own ghost path, hearing that voice across the water and caught there for a moment on the river's bank, earthbound as a dodo bird. Yes, a dodo bird. Imagine that. I'll finish with a prose poem or two, so that sort of a slight disorientation that happens in a prose poem. Ex nihilo. A bird fell out of the sky, frozen in flight. That was the winter no snow fell, and the ground was iron. I was reading the rhyme of the ancient mariner and thinking about my father. My ancestry seemed to have disappeared. I couldn't trace it past my great-grandparents, and I knew nothing about them. It was all a blank, as if they had abruptly appeared on Earth 200 years ago, ex nihilo. I have recurring dreams of flying. I'm high above the earth, drifting, looking down on the diminutive towns and roads. Suddenly I'm falling, plummeting. A moment later I smell the earth, loam and forest. One of these days I won't wake. That same cold winter, I saw a frozen gull on the roof, its feet caught beneath a shingle, wings widespread, an appalling angel. Dallas Beach. Let the young reduce experience, place it in boxes, denotations. I've grown too old for that, though lately I've almost come to see everything in a gravestone. Talk about reduction. How else to articulate the inarticulate? And so, sidestepping a disbelief in absence, almost an anguish, not into belief or words but into stone, a stone in a field of stones, holding the haunt. How the universe keeps expanding and becoming smaller, how it fits into a grave. But that's too grandiose, isn't it? And ambiguous. There's nothing there, is there? Nothing but turned soil. Standing among the rocks on Dallas Beach, I don't know what I'm talking about anymore. I'll watch it all going out on the tide, like bladder rack. 